Hello, this is Justin Williams with the Wolfpacker Podcast. I'm joined today, as always, by editor of thewolfpacker.com and fellow co-host Matt Carter. We have a very, very fun episode for you today. In fact, it might be might be an episode for the record books. I mean, it might be, <laughs> might be an all-time Wolfpacker Podcast episode because it was an all-time day for Wolfpackers. I mean, what what more could you ask for? NC State gets the win over UNC in Chapel Hill in double overtime, 30-27 to 27 over the Tar Heels. NC State men beat Butler 76-61 in the uh, battle for Atlantis, fifth place game. Yeah, I know it doesn't sound so sexy, but <laughs> get to beat up on a quality opponent in, in the Big East and uh, get to get a little bit of I don't want to say revenge, but it was still a little sweet to beat the team that beloved Manny Bates ended up transferring to. Of course, I think I think don't forget Tyler Lewis. Oh yeah, and the Tyler Lewis game. I I saw that on Twitter. I meant to. It's still early here. We're recording this early Saturday morning after Black Friday. I'm on the West Coast, so I just rolled out of bed. Matt is fully <laughs> energized because he probably just got. A great night of sleep after staying up till the wee hours of the morning to cover the men's basketball team. But uh, I'm sure Matt's on cloud nine too, and now he's got now he's got a Saturday off for the first time in quite some time because we're getting towards the end of the college football season. But that said, NC State fans know how great of a day it was yesterday, and I will get into more details of that. But first, some quick reminders for the listeners and viewers at home: please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us. Apple, Spotify, Google Play, we're there. Plus, you can watch us on our YouTube channel. Now, Matt Carter made a promise on the last episode that if NC State won uh, on Friday in Chapel Hill, the football team, that our lower third at the bottom of our YouTube stream would would be lit red. And just like Dave Dorn told Chancellor Woodson to light it red last night, light the, light the bell tower red. Matt Carter was going to light our lower third red. Um, well, we are working with a beta version of StreamYard here due to the great folks at On3. Great technology. Don't know if this is user error on Matt's end, but I don't know if he has the capability to change it to red at this point in time. So we've still got a blue lower third. If you want to check that out, go to our YouTube channel. All kidding aside, please go to our YouTube channel. Subscribe, rate, and review. Um, give this video a thumbs up and drop a comment while you're at it. After a big game like that, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of conversation in the comments. So we appreciate all your support. Please subscribe, uh, podcast, video on YouTube, uh, like us everywhere. Give us five stars. Give us comments. Give us everything. We need all the engagement you can get. Um, head over to thewolfpacker.com. For just $10, you can get a special deal of premium subscription through the beginning of next college football season. I know this season is coming to wraps, but we've still got the bowl game to consider. Um, still got what seems to be shaping up to be a very interesting college basketball season for the Wolfpack, men's and women's. Uh, plus, we got spring sports and uh, recruiting never stops. I mean, that's year round. So uh, lots of great premium content to access for just 10 bucks. Takes you through the uh, end of August 2023. So better part of about nine months there. And uh, a great gift, may I say, to give during the holiday season. So it is Black Friday slash Cyber Monday shopping weekend. Everybody's doing their holiday shopping for friends and loved ones. So maybe consider gifting the gift of being an informed Wolfpack fan to the Wolfpacker in your life by going to thewolfpacker.com and subscribing. Last but certainly not least, and speaking of stocking stuffers, head over to rogueshop.com. Rogueshop.com, that's R-O-G-U-E shop.com for premium CBD and Delta-8 cannabis goods. They've got all kinds of great stuff. They've got cannabis itself. They have cartridges. They have oils. They have edibles. They have lotions. They have all kinds of great stuff. It's, it's pretty amazing how many different ways you can consume cannabis in 2022. And Rogue Shop has you covered. Great products to really help with some of the anxiety and stress you deal with day to day. If you have trouble falling asleep at night, even if you just deal with general pain, chronic pain, inflammation, 
Uh, cannabis is a great natural way to help remedy some of those things. Uh, founded by a husband and wife, a uh, small business. The husband is a disabled veteran that struggled with some of those issues and, and uh, was turned on to natural products such as Delta 8 and CBD. Helped him so much that he wanted to create a business to help share the uh, the natural wellness with everybody else. So the great folks every, over there, they've got great products. And with the holidays coming up, and it's another great stocking stuffer. Get some get some CBD and Delta 8 for your loved ones or for yourself or why not both? So head over to rogueshop.com. That's R-O-G-U-E shop.com. Support us by supporting them. They are proud sponsors of the Wolfpacker podcast. And uh, head over there now and start shopping. All right. Matt. Real, quick, real quick, I wanted to add for rogueshop.com because it is oh. Black Friday, but it's also Cyber Monday, right? Oh. So... Uh, Got it coming they, up. They have 30% off um, from Black Friday through Cyber Monday. So starting Friday all the way through Monday, you can get 30% off all their products at their store. So just a heads up about that. Very important. Yeah, very important mention. And uh, yeah, save some money on some really premium quality products. So head over there now and add it to your Black Friday slash Cyber Monday shopping list. All right, we're about... Six and a half minutes into this podcast, Matt. So let's uh, let's start talking some football. I don't even know where to begin with uh, what turned out to be another crazy meeting of NC State UNC last year at Carter Finley. NC State had a miraculous come from behind victory with two late touchdowns to propel the Wolfpack to the home win over the Tar Heels. This year, a little bit different. Not uh, different, different context. NC State comes in this game as a clear underdog, rolls out four string quarterback, former scout team quarterback earlier this season, Ben Finley, younger brother of Ryan Finley. Um, and NC State goes to Chapel Hill and really just hammers UNC pretty consistently throughout this game. Pretty miraculous that. UNC was able to force this game to overtime. This game really should have been over in regulation. I thought it was for a second. Mm -hmm. I was screaming in the headquarters of CBS San Francisco, KPIX. Everyone's wondering what, what the hell I'm screaming about, why I'm saying it wasn't a catch. Wasn't a catch. There was still time on the clock. UNC finds a way to find the end zone at the end of regulation, forces overtime, and it all comes down to – Yet another missed kick. It's it, this this game of football is so interesting. These guys lay it out all out on the line for sixty minutes plus, and at the end of the day, sometimes it just comes down to you know whether the hundred and eighty pound kicker on either side is able to kick a football through yellow uprights, and that decides the victor. So. Matt, just uh, I've talked a lot here, but why don't I throw it to you and just kind of see? I mean, what, how are you feeling? How how are you feeling after yesterday? Uh, I'm exhausted, but I, I want to say the difference is NC State had Christopher Dunn, UNC didn't. That was the difference. I mean, that turned out to be the difference in the game. I, it, first off, shout. I mean, there have been a lot of shout outs. I don't know if enough shout out to Christopher Dunn, who may be the MVP of the season, All American, probably kicker. Finally missed one, and that's forgivable. He had made like 20, what, 21 in a row or 22, and, you know, didn't let it bother him smoothly, easily made two kicks in overtime. And, you know, you feel for Noah Bonetta, North Carolina. Nobody wants to pile on a kicker. I mean, nobody feels worse. May, may I add something there? Interesting nugget with Noah Burnett. I coached him at Martin yeah. Middle School when he was an eighth grader. <laughs> great kid great kid i i honestly felt so bad when i saw that i i mean look we're uh, we're all gonna enjoy the win <laughs> yeah. i enjoyed the win but there's, there's always people at the other end and he's a really good kid and he was a heck of a football player he played safety for us so anyways that was <laughs> that was my nugget on noah burnett yeah and just you know i look at it I don't know what happened on the last kick. At first, I thought it might have been blocked because, yeah, I believe it was uh, Devon Betty in the middle really put a, a good whack on it, um, took a good swing at it. But I think he just 
he looks like one of those Matt Carter golf shots off the tee box. And, and uh, you know, that's why I aim right every time I go into the tee box because I know it's going left and there's no way I can fix it. You can tell me everything I'm doing wrong on the swing is still going to go left. I, I'm, I'm not fixing it. So, um, so that was a big difference. But I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I told people at halftime, shouldn't be 17 10. And you look at the the one touchdown UNC got. I was set up by a bad snap that NC State had to fall on at the two yard line for a loss of 18 yards. Um, that gives UNC the football, I think, the 41 yard line. So they get good field position. They lose a yard on first down and then throw an incomplete pass when Drake May was under a lot of pressure, which was a theme in this game, by the way. Um, and Drake May's under a lot of pressure, throws an incomplete pass. It wasn't going to be completed, but the weak pitch did hold. I saw it. He held. Then they get a 10-yard penalty. So instead of third and 11 at the 40, it's first and 10 at midfield. And then a couple plays later, Drake May gets away with an awful pass that Peyton Wilson should have intercepted, had his hand on it, just couldn't complete the catch. And then after that, UNC ends up scoring a touchdown, I believe, on a Drake May touchdown run. So their lone touchdown was entirely because of mistakes by NC State in the first half. And NC State, by the way, also fumbled in the red zone on a third and one play. If you know, if they get that first down, they're probably scoring a touchdown given the way the first half is going. So that could have been a, easily a two score, if not something like a 17 3 or even like a 21 3 type of game at halftime. Carolina was lucky to be in it. Um, I thought the second half was more evenly played. Uh, you know, both teams missed field goals. The UNC missed a shorter field goal than Christopher Dunn. Uh, huge play by Tanner Engel was in a game of huge plays. You kind of forget he had that huge interception with about four or five minutes left. Very acrobatic interception. Um, that set up the Devin Carter touchdown, but you know, Carolina converted a fourth down. Give Drake May credit that they drive to end the game. He kept making clutch throw after clutch throw with a lot of pressure in his in his face. But there's no doubt in my mind, NC State was a better team. Yeah, you know, on the car ride over, Ethan and I were talking. I said, Look, if NC State was full strength, I'd feel really supremely confident about this game. I just didn't think North Carolina was that good. Look, they may go win the ACC title next week. More power to them. Um, because Clemson, nothing special. I don't, I don't know what they're doing against South Carolina because we're recording this podcast then. But um, Clemson's certainly beatable. But this is not a great UNC team. They're forcing it 9-1. and one. They happen to win six straight one-possessing games against a crap schedule. And they were probably a better indication of what UNC's record is probably they, against this schedule. They're probably a seven and five team. The ball bounced their way. They're a nine and three team. But that's also against a weak schedule. You give them a more average schedule, not even a hard schedule, just an average schedule. There's probably another loss in there, and they're probably a 500 team. They just do one thing really well, which is throw the football. And NC State was able to mitigate that. They got, I mean, that was amazing, the amount of pressure they got on Drake May. A lot of times, just bringing three guys. And we talked about Carolina doesn't pass protect well. And that showed really blatantly, obviously. And they were able to defend Josh down reasonably well, despite being down to their fifth option at nickel. They had to convert the weak pitch over from corner to a nickel on five days' notice to play this game. And Derek Pitts, by the way, was playing with one hand, with one hand. His right hand was heavily wrapped because it was injured, but he was able to play with it. And then I had, had know, to leave the game at one point. Yeah. Now his hands were strong enough that he was still able to help plant the flag at ah. midfield after the yeah. game. Um, yeah. So it, it, it was feeling good at that point. But uh, yeah, I, I just think, you know, congratulations to UNT on winning the Coast for going to the ACC championship. They may win the ACC championship. So they deserve all their congratulations, but they're not a great team. And as I wrote in my column, the one thing NC State fans can take away from this, 
They, they were a better team than UNC. I agree with you. They were a better team, and UNC was kind of fortunate that they were And, and can I add something there? Yeah. <clears throat> a much, much better coach team. <laughs> a yeah. much better coach team. I've heard I mean, a lot of people could... from some of my brethren on the UNC side of the beat about uh, about how Carolina prepared and called that game. Look, we we we, we always go back and forth, but uh, you know, I got I got some crap after I gave <laughs> props to the coaching staff after the Wake Forest win, and what does NC State go do? They they looked less than impressive in the in the two games after that, but. <laughs> In this game, the one that matters, the one that matters, especially for recruiting reasons, uh, NC State was the team that should be proud of its coaching staff. I mean, I thought offensively, defensively, look, Tony Gibson's been a phenomenal defensive coordinator all season and yeah. has dialed up blitzes, dialed up the right packages, seemingly always at the right times. After this game, it's kind of hard to – I mean, you have to kind of say that NC State has been the best consistent defense in the ACC this season. From the beginning of the year to the end of the year, you, you've you kind of expected the same results. And there's been a few games where there's just been too much put on the defense's plate, and it, 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 it can't win a game on its own. But this defense has, this defense has made the difference between an 8-4 and four season and, and what could have been – you know, a losing season, really. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, um, they got after the game. What best defense in the ACC? I mean, it's them or Clemson. They're the two best defenses in the ACC. And um, yeah, I thought they were phenomenal. They were flying. I, you know what? I get a vote wow. in the ACC, and I'm gonna go ahead and announce that I'm probably voting Drake Thomas as ACC Defensive Player of the Year. Um, they were phenomenal. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I agree with your assessment. In this game, at least, they certainly looked a lot more well coached. I mean, you know? and I thought it was I thought it was a phenomenal game play call wise from Tim Beck. I mean, you're dealing with your four string quarterback. He was your four stringer going into the year. Now I know he's probably better than most four string quarterbacks in the ACC because he was he, I mean, he's played before. He was, but he was the scout team quarterback through most of the season. And to go out and put on a performance like that against any Power Five team on the road in a rivalry game, um, extremely impressive. I mean, I thought the one mistake yesterday was the was the third and one run call to, uh, to the direct snap to Jack Chambers or late in this in the first half. Look, I mean, fi find me an offensive coordinator that's not going to make one mistake. Yeah. During a game. But it yes, that one was that one was um I think I said I think I was watching that game and I had to go to the bathroom and I was waiting till NC State scored. And when I saw that when I saw it was a run, I said that's so blanking predictable and stormed off. <laughs> um but other than that, it was a really, really well called game on both ends. Ben Finley, he's gonna go down in NC State lore for this one. Um, it kind I of mean, like Texas place was that Reggie Gillespie, right? You had the Reggie Gillespie game. That's yeah. what he'll forever be remembered for, scoring five touchdowns, winning in overtime in Chapel Hill. This will be known as the Ben Finley game. The, the, the game where Ben Finley – I do think it's fair to wonder. And look, I, Jack Chamber, for those who have not talked to him, I don't know him personally, right? I've only experienced him in interview settings come to cross as an unbelievably great young man. And I think got a great future. I hope, you know, you know he seems like the guy you're, you, you would want on your football team. Um, anyway, I do think it's fair to wonder at this point, you know, what, why would Jack Chambers kind of consider backup? Because I've, I've seen that a lot. Where like, you know, with Ben Finley, why was he fourth string? And why was MJ Morris originally third string? You know, I think that's one of the things that if you had a small nitpicky criticism after the joyous celebration, you do kind of wonder, in hindsight, why were Jack Chambers? I thought, Lord, I, I thought Lauren Brownlow brought up a good point on Twitter when she said, yeah. I wonder, 
you know, when, when NC State's making its decisions on the depth chart at quarterback, how much goes into that? These quarterbacks have to go against NC State's defense the entire yeah. offseason and in practice. I mean, yeah. maybe just his seniority alone helped produce the best results against NC State's defense. But, you know, I could I could very easily see young MJ Morris and young Ben Finley struggling tremendously day in, day out against the defense. And then, you know, yeah. when they get out in the game, it's like, what? It's like taking the, the baseball bat donut off when you're on deck. You know, it's just like, oh, everything feels so much lighter out here. I thought Ben Finley had a great – Ben Finley had an unbelievable amount of quotes after the game. So uh, a couple of reasons to go to our YouTube channel. One, check out the video I got of um, the planting of the flag at midfield. I got totally lucky with that. Um, where, uh, you know, we, we had a two-man operation – and NC State's been doing Zoom all season, but on the road they also do in person. And so they sent out a Zoom link, so they were going to have a Zoom available. And I told Ethan, you know, they, it's much better to get video off of Zoom. And Ethan's responsibility, as Justin knows, he had this old responsibility to do the locker room notebook. So he said, you know, Ethan, you, since you're writing the locker room notebook, you should probably go down there and I'll hang up up here and record uh, the Zoom so that we have the better video quality for the, uh, rather than, you know, a non mic you know, the, the computer closer, you get better audio and everything. And, uh, and then it turns out that uh, I looked up and they were waving the flag around. And I actually, Dweek Pitts was waving the flag, and he ran all the way down from one end zone to the other, and then came back. And I recorded that, and then he came back, and then I, I, it wasn't great video, and I thought he was going to hand the flag off. And I said, well, let me, let me get the next guy waving. And then the two of them were Jordan, Derek, uh, Devin Carter and Dweek Pitts. And then they started running together, and they, I could tell they were going to midfield. Oh boy, do it, do it, do it, you know. And then Jordan yeah. Houston running with him. And the next thing you know, they planted it. Uh, although in an artificial turf, you can't really plant a flag on an artificial turf, mm -hmm. by the way. S but, slippery, slippery turf, by the way. Yeah, well, but that video is on YouTube. But also, Ben Finley, great quote about uh, he said, Look at my uniform, it's pristine white. He said, and he said, He's just camping out, <laughs> he's just camping oh, out. Man. Yeah, oh, I, man. Camp, I think he used the word camp out. He said he camped out in the backfield. Well, um, I didn't I did not hear that. That's okay. Yeah, a lot of great quotes. But um and they were also a great quote about how he graduated from NC State in December in finance. And he said, uh, I didn't try to get into Carolina, but according to Drake, I couldn't anyway. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. I mean you knew you knew you knew those quotes were gonna be dug up. That was and then Drake corrected, made his own bed there. He corrected his brother on Carter Finley. You know, his, his brother incorrectly called it Car uh, Keenan Stadium, Carter Finley North. And uh, he corrected his brother and proclaimed it Carter Finley West. But the, the larger point I was trying to make before I got sidetracked is to what Justin said. Of, you know, Finley was talking about how he had all day to throw the football. And then you do wonder if after going against – and she states defense, even if it's, you know, probably 70% full speed. And after going against Louisville's defense, too, let's remember Louisville has a really aggressive defense. If he felt like you just mentioned that analogy of like going to the plate and finally getting the donut off the baseball bat, it was like, oh crap, this is so much easier than what I've been dealing with. And maybe that played a role in his performance against UNC. And it was great to see Devin Carter have a big game. And, um, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the future holds for him. Did I don't know. Was he a guy that walked on senior day? He did walk on senior day. And, you know, he came close to going pro last year. I, I think he was tweeting this year as a senior year. He's been in college for five years. And, yeah, it was, and this is a great reason to be subscribing to the Wolfpack. There's going to be a lot of decisions coming down the pipe here, both transfer portal and moving on type and, you know, a lot of these guys have um, been in college now five years. Some of them, you know, 
the, the last wave that were in college for five years were willing to do a sixth year. These guys, you know, willing to do that. I mean, that's a big question. You know, guys like Devin Leary, Peyton Wilson, Devin Carter, you know, Drake Thomas. It's some interesting decisions that they, those guys have to make about whether they want to go for a sixth year or five years is enough. But I agree that he was really good. And you needed that Devin Carter all season long. As you, one of the reasons why the offense underperformed was, as you mentioned, it was it. It was just a, from a health standpoint and a production standpoint, it was it was a challenging year for Devin Carter. Nothing that a UNC defense can't fix. Mm. Man, throwing some throwing some zingers <laughs> on this podcast. Mm. Uh, it, it, we mentioned it, but I think we need to specifically talk about it in more detail. The defense, and specifically. I got to say, I mean, look, Drake Thomas is always excellent. Peyton Wilson is always excellent. Isaiah Moore is always excellent. We know the linebackers are so darn good. Uh, and this game always means a little bit more to Peyton Wilson because of the you know, recruiting background at UNC and NC State, you know, an Orange County kid. And he, you could tell, I mean, you could tell he was hurt in this game too, but he did not want to come off the field. Tanner Engel, though. I mean, yeah. he was a – he was he was Tanner Engel at his finest in this game. I've always loved watching Tanner Engel. He's he's just that safety in the backfield that's – you know, when he's on that football field, he's just a mean dude. He's just – he's just a mean dude. He's looking for all the smoke. There was a couple of hits where I just, you know, oh, shoot. But, but, <laughs> but, I mean – you know, like the like the play is slowing down, and then he just comes like it's kind of a gang tackle, and then he just comes in and just knocks the crap out of you know the UNC ball carrier. Yeah, he played an excellent game. Um, and shout out to the defensive line for being able to put pressure on Drake May consistently throughout this game without having to dial up too many blitzes. NC State had to be great in coverage to hold Drake May to just 233 yards, and that you know, and that was in two overtimes. That was with a pretty strong second half. Um, Drake is an excellent player, and, and to, to slow him down like that is just you got to you got to give this Wolfpack defense an A plus plus in this game. Yeah, and and only eight yards per completion, which is a very low number for what like UNC likes to do. Lowest yards in a game this year for UNC, despite having two added possessions in overtime. That was average yard per play in the game this year for UNC. Um, regulation ended at 24 points. You know, that, I think they had 17 against Georgia Tech. So right there with the lowest that they've scored in regulation in a game. And quite frankly, uh, two of their touchdowns were, were bad luck on NC State's part. We already went over the, the – uh, the bad snap and then the defensive holding and dropped interception. Let's not also forget they tied the game at 17 17 in the fourth quarter because Caden Nuncaster, who was sensational overall, missed one punt. And then his short punt also happened to take a really awful bounce for NC State. And so his punt from the 20 yard line netted 18 yards, and UNC took over at the 38. So that was their two touchdowns. Two of their three touchdowns and regulations were self-inflicted by NC State and really bad luck by NC State setting up UNC. And then the last touchdown, they needed a fourth and I forget what it was, but Drake May just kind of lobbed it up to Bryson Nedbit at the five-yard line with, what, 12, 18 seconds left or something like that. So sensational effort by the defense. And they're the reason you mentioned, they're the reason NC State's eight and four. And darn close to being nine and three, you know. And they're the reason why NC State also pulled out some wins against ECU and Florida State and Virginia Tech. And quite yep. frankly, otherwise they probably don't have a whole lot of business winning. So, yeah, a lot those of are, those are all uh, those are all flipped outcomes if this defense isn't what it was mm -hmm. all season. So, um, and it's going to make NC State a tough opponent, and no matter what bowl. It ends up going to, I would hope that this game, you know, puts a little bit, gives NC State a little bit more favorability in terms of potential bowl outcomes. I mean, I know that's all kind of, once you get past the New Year's Six with the ACC, there are tiers, but 
it kind of seems like the Bulls kind of pick who they can sell the most tickets to and it's kind of a political play there. But NC State should have an interesting matchup no matter what, because this team is too good for the television markets to, you know, bury it in some crap bowl. So uh, I, I think I think NC State's going to yeah. have another great opponent coming up in a bowl game. I was a little nervous that that there were some projections creeping in that they may be headed to the Gasparilla Bowl. No, oh. in Tampa, Florida. So. That's uh, December twenty third. That's an early bowl. It's a good destination. You're playing in a NFL stadium in Tampa, but it'd be a weak opponent. So you know that one. And, to, just the sound of the Gasparilla Bowl sounds yeah. like a bad bowl. Military Bowl in D.C. was a popular choice, it seemed like, for NC State. But it looked like it'd be a pretty decent opponent, maybe a Cincinnati or Central Florida type in that game. Um, and then, of course, Charlotte. I haven't been to Charlotte since the Mississippi State loss. Uh, that's, what, about eight years now? Not seven years? So, um, you know, that could be a potential one to watch, too. I mean, I'm sure Charlotte... You know, North Carolina has been that went there last year, so they're not interested in UNC. And yeah, Let's see what works. I'd be cool with Charlotte. I'd be cool. It's Big Ten opponent this year, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah but there were some projections of Maryland. I thought that would be a really good matchup in State Maryland. Um, but you also have Duke. Now, you, you would figure Duke is bowl eligible. Would Charlotte be interested in Duke, or would Duke be better off? Maybe in the fin uh, uh, the bowl game at Yankee Stadium, um, they got a large alumni base up in. I'm, I'm not joking; it's true. They do have a large yeah, alumni. No, base. I, I know you're not. I know, I know it's not a joke, but it it still is funny because it's because it's true. Yeah, they probably would be better off playing in the Pinstripe Bowl. You're gonna you're gonna be able to sell more tickets for Duke at the Pinstripe Bowl than probably just as many as you would be able to in Charlotte, to be honest. Yeah. So. Anyway, we, we don't have to we don't have to delve into bowl talk. Uh, I do want to get to the men's basketball team too a little bit, just because I mean it. Uh, you want to go ahead and give out game balls for the football game before we transition sure. here? Um, yeah, I'll give I it to the obvious. Or go ahead, go ahead. I'll give it to, I'll give it to the obvious Ben Finley. Um, um, yeah, they they, they come off and and be on the scout team all year long and just I gave it to him really for the interview. Go watch his interview at you on YouTube. It was one of the most fun interviews. He had a fun interview midweek uh with reporters. And he he is take Ryan Finley and it's a completely one eighty different personality from Ryan Finley. He is fun loving, he's loose, he just chills. Um yeah, he's a funny guy. And uh, you know, It'd be interesting to see uh, that he plays way into the conversation. Of, let's say Devin Leary moves on. Uh, would NC State now look at him and say, you know what, we're comfortable with MJ Morris and Ben Finley battling it out for the starting quarterback job next year? Either way, I'm not too concerned about the backup situation. I mean, look, clearly it's important to have an, a good backup. As, as we've learned from watching NC State football the past three seasons, uh, a backup quarterback is very important for longevity and consistent results in college football. So um, we'll see. It's going to be an interesting off season for this Wolfpack team. I'm going to give my game ball to Tanner Engel. I gave him plenty of praise earlier on. Um, no disrespect. I mean, game balls to the entire defense. Once again, it was a, it was an 11 man effort plus. Um, but Tanner Engel just, has been one of, has been a favorite of mine ever since he's played at NC State. I just love his play style. Um, sometimes he he in the past he's been prone to kind of boneheaded penalties, but most of it is just out of sheer aggression, and and you can live with that because when you're on the football field, that's the mentality you got to have. And he's a football player through and through. Um, would love to see. I. I I'm interested to see where his career goes from here, but man, he, he laid it all out on the line in Chapel Hill yesterday. So uh, Tanner Engel gets my game ball and uh, yeah, just an overall great win um, to beat UNC and like that. I mean, it looked like UNC had to suffer really two bone crushing losses in this game because they thought they thought they, 
they thought they tied the game at the end of regulation. Then that gets overturned. Then they do get the call. So then they get then they get hope again. It seemed like going into overtime, UNC had momentum. And then NC State just holds out. And to lose on a missed kick is devastating to any team. NC State knows that as well as anybody. So uh yeah, and it, it's always it's always great to beat Carolina in uh in devastating fashion. It it's um you know, they, they say it's a good day to be a Tar Heel a lot. G-D-B-A-T-H. Yesterday was a bad day to be a Tar Heel. Uh, yesterday was a really bad day to be a Tar Heel. Not only do you lose to NC State at home in football, the men's basketball team also loses to uh, Iowa State. You can see men's basketball got some things to work out early on this season, but this is not – the UNC podcast. This is an NC State podcast, and let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the men's basketball team before we wrap up here, Matt. NC State coming away from the Bahamas with two wins. Yes, you lose a game to Kansas, a number three team in the country, AP ranked. I, Ken Palm has me all weird with the numbers because Kansas is like twenty in Ken Palm. Doesn't matter. We know Kansas is a quality opponent. Is going to be a Final Four contender. NC State played a great game against the Jayhawks, came up short. Jayhawks shot really well from three. Had they not shot so hot, NC State probably wins that game. But then they take care of business with the rest of the tournament because it's set up so that you get three games no matter what. And in the ACC this year, you need all the quality wins you could possibly get. So what does NC State do? It goes on, takes care of business against Dayton the day after, and then beats Butler in the fifth place game. So, NC State, one of uh, one of only a handful of teams that gets to leave the Bahamas with a winning record, and uh, I think what's most encouraging, Matt, is that NC State put together three really solid games that you're pre- that I think anybody in the fan base would feel pretty confident with, mm-hmm. and we did not even see close to the best of Turquavion Smith. In fact, I thought. I thought he he left a little more to be desired, and especially in the last two games, I know he's going to turn it around. Um, so it, it makes you wonder once he gets going, and once the rest of the supporting cast, you know, if it can maintain its production. This is a very talented NC State basketball team. Not something we have been able to say the past couple seasons. This is going to be a tough out, night in, night out in the ACC, and you know, I. I don't think it's I don't think it's improper to get excited about this team as a potential as a team that you know can be competing for an NCAA tournament bid. They've got the talent. Yeah. No, I mean, right now, I, I I personally don't give one iota about top twenty five polls in college basketball because you have a tournament that settles it all on the court. There's sixty eight teams. Yeah, you know, about twenty of them probably or 25 of them are from one bid conferences. I understand that. So, but if you're a top 40 team in the country, you're going to make the NCAA tournament, right? Because that's just the way it's set up. And, um, and really, quite frankly, it's probably even longer than that. So um, right now, I if, having that disclaimer that I don't really give two cents about top 25 polls in college basketball. You can't tell me there are 25 teams that look more impressive right now than NC State. Um, they're 6-1. and one. We talked about how this would get important. We, we talked about, you and I just talked about this, Justin. They need two wins in the Bahamas, realistically. They got two wins. Now, the key is you really need Dayton and Butler to back that up. And, I, you know, we talked before the podcast. I was kind of hoping BYU beat Butler because I have more faith that BYU would hold up as a better opportunity late in the season. I don't know how good Butler is. Um, we'll see when they get into Big East play. It seemed like from hope. the broadcast that they were hurt too, like they had some missing pieces. Yeah, so we'll see how. I know they had a transfer that was a pretty good regarded transfer. I think his name's Ali Ali. I don't recall seeing on the court. Is this Thad Mata's first year at Butler? Yeah, it is. So, so early on. Yeah. 
and then you hope Dayton gets it turned around. I mean, it, they've lost four in a row against four good teams, but three and four is not a great start. And so they need to get theirs turned around. And um, But let's say if Dayton and Butler can hold up, you've got yourself two quad twos at minimum, and Dayton had the chance to be – if you're going on Ken Palm, we don't know the net yet. The net is what matters. And – That'll be out in early December, but if they can be top 50 in the net, that's a quad one. And those are precious jewels when you start looking at bubble teams. You hope that NC State's not even in the bubble situation, which is what I'm beginning to wonder. Is this team good enough that come late February, March, they're not in the bubble conversation? We just know Easy. they're in. Easy. That's I'm with gonna... I'm with you. But, I'm, but I'm let me add you. Let me add this to what, what my concern is. It's an old team. They got to spend two weeks practicing to go to the Bahamas and play a couple games in the summer before everybody else did. So I do – my one concern is I like the point you bring about we hadn't seen the best of Tequavion, but I also wonder have we seen – is this team closer to a ceiling than other teams is at this point in mm -hmm. the season? That makes sense. Are they – operating at a higher percentage of their potential than a lot of other teams that have just started later and they're younger. And, you know, you can see Kansas getting better and better, right? Because they got some younger guys. They got some guys stepping up in new roles. They got some newcomers like McCullough coming in. Um, so, you know, they're going to get better and better. So how much better can NC they get besides Tequavion kind of playing his best. Uh, not that he was bad in the Bahamas, but he clearly wasn't his best. Um, so that's the question. We'll find out. But I love what Kevin Keith said after the game. He wants this culture, this team to be playing hard. And they played hard, especially on defense. I thought it was some unfair criticism when people were complaining about the threes they gave up against Kansas. A couple of them came at the end of the shot clock. Yeah. Um, they made life very hard for Butler and the Dayton guards. Both those guards had – both of those teams' guards had hard times against NC State. And even Kansas probably had a few more turnovers than they're accustomed to. So, um, they're playing hard, which is – Justin, you know, if that's 90% of the game on defense, it's effort. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a matter of <laughs> do you consistently put in the effort to play defense. And – so far, that answer's been yes. Especially when you play man to man. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's all it is. It's just, it's just grit. Just, just stick it with your man, and you know, defending without fouling. And I mean, I think this NC, you know, this NC State team can find itself in foul trouble, um, as we've seen early on. That might be, you know, something that comes that comes back to bite it later on in the year. But the fact of the matter is, NC State has a great backcourt this year did not uh you know we knew that Jarkel Joyner was going to be an experienced older presence in the locker room didn't expect him to be I mean right now I, 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 I'm, 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 yeah I'm, I'm at a loss for words with like a I was I was looking for maybe like an NBA player comp but uh I'll I'll, I'll think about that more but Man, I mean, 20, 27 against Dayton in 33 minutes. Um, I don't expect him to put put together an effort like that night in, night out. But when you have guys like Jarkel Joyner, a legit lottery pick prospect in Terquavion Smith, mm -hmm. and the surprise of the year, Casey Morsell, early on, has been all ACC caliber you know, and this is a guy that had terrible numbers when he transferred from Virginia to NC State, was much more of a factor in NC State's rotation last season, um, was, you know, pretty pretty average ACC player, seemingly, for, for most of the season last year. There was nothing really about his game that flashed and made you say, oh, wow, you know, watch out for Casey Morsell. But this year, He's he's more aggressive on the boards. He's shooting lights out. Now let's see if it continues. You know, I mean, he's got it. it it's it's a long season. It's still early on, but his shooting numbers early on this season are tremendous. And when you have those three threats in your backcourt, 
you can afford to have one of them to have an off night because you can count on the fact that one of them is going to have a good night. And if one of them, you know, plays at least average or above average, then you're going to get some production at that backcourt. And then you combine that with the new front court that NC State has with, you know, a, a Jack Clark who seems to be a perfect fit at that four position in Kevin Keats' system, um, who can shoot the ball. I mean, when's the last time NC State had a four that can shoot from three? Like, legitimately, not DJ Funderburk trying to take threes. I mean, taking threes and making them. Uh, then Mahorchic, I mean, he's just... He's just a big dude down. He's just a big mean dude down there. That's a defensive threat, and uh, he plays with passion, man. You you can tell that his teammates love that guy. Um, and DJ Burns, I mean, just rolling out like the YMCA, uh, super, you know, future YMCA superstar in the making right there. He's got some old man game to him, um, and he's a big dude. And I hope. You know, he, he continues to get more and more conditioned as the year goes on. But you can tell DJ Burns is going to be a fan favorite. Um, just just the play style of his game. I mean, every time he gets the ball in the post, he, he's a threat. And uh, they made a comment on, on the broadcast last night for the Butler game. It's like, I don't think DJ Burns has passed it one time when he gets the ball on the low block. And there's a good reason why is because he's pretty darn efficient when he gets around the rim. So his team's talented. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the schedule's pretty light, you know, leading up towards the end of the year. I mean, you've got three games against teams ranked lower than 100 on Ken Palm. you got William & Mary, Pittsburgh, and Coppin State. Pittsburgh, a, a bottom-tier ACC team, all at home in the next three games. You go on the road to face Miami after that. That can be a tough game. Um, Furman and Vanderbilt at home and, and neutral respectively. But I mean, you're looking at the schedule for the rest of the year. And I mean, NC state's going to be, a, this, these are all winnable games for, and, and you yeah. know, the key will be the, the Vanderbilt and Furman games in particular are big, because you're just not going to wrap up any non-conference quality with this schedule. It's just calling it for what it is. And basically we're just, the Bahamas and those two non-conference games between Vanderbilt and Furman. So you really pop in, given the way, the, I mean, look, St. Bonaventure just beat Notre Dame by double digits yesterday. So add up another tough loss on the ACC <laughs> resume. And they've been a lot of games, but they have come close in the ACC, like NC State, Kansas, like Duke, Kansas. Clemson came very close to beating Iowa, top 25 yesterday. But they didn't, and they had also lost to um, South Carolina earlier. So, you know, other than Virginia, and I would argue NC State, now Duke got them went uh, beat Xavier, so that one kind of helps a little bit. You know, Syracuse lost to St. John's in overtime, another close call that could have helped out the ACC. Um, really, the only two ACC teams, that, and, and Virginia Tech a little bit has kind of carried their weight, but. Um, they just Virginia a whole lot. will be good. Yeah, but my point is that there's not a whole lot of quality wins in the ACC, which gets you to the problem you had last year. When you start looking at what matters, and that is, you're just not going to have a lot of opportunity because they didn't step up in non-conference play. The conference wins won't carry the weight that you conventional wisdom or conventional perception would lead you to believe they have in the ACC, which is why. No Furman and Vanderbilt game adds even more weight. And neither one of them are world beaters. They're not going to be the uh, top of the resume, but you, you have to take advantage of those opportunities because you've got to improve your numbers somehow. Um, and so those two games will be extremely important. No hangover against William and May. They had a lead on Pittsburgh at halftime yesterday, William and May. Uh, you can't, you know, don't want another game like Elon where you kind of just butted your way through against a really bad team. And it was much closer than it should have been. So you do, you, you know. That might have been apathy of, can we just, can we can we play a good team? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can we can we play somebody that's going to make us work? I agree with you. These next three games, you need to handle business. And that will get you to 8-1 and one and 1-0 one and oh in the ACC. And then you have a big three-game stretch. Any road wins against a good ACC team. Miami on the road is another big one because that's a rare 
good opportunity in the ACC. Miami's held their weight too. So yeah, yeah. Those three, that'll be a huge three game stretch for NC State. Well, the good news for NC State, you know, for resume schedule purposes, you get you get UNC and you get Duke twice, and you know that, you know, no matter how much those teams struggle, they're gonna they're probably gonna be tournament teams. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you get Miami uh, twice, and that you know that could be a quality ACC opponent. I mean, look, this it seems clear cut that Virginia, UNC, and Duke are the three best teams in the ACC. And then after that, it's very up for grabs. I know you're giving a face about Duke, but no, UNC. I mean, have they proven that they're clearly better than NC State right now? I'm not. If you well, give them it, last, if you take in last March, yes, they are clearly better than NC State because they have everybody back. But if you were just to take this year's schedule and not say anything about last year, I hear you. Put, put, put the results side by side. Who would you say has been better right now? I mean, cl- clearly NC State. Yeah. But it, I will but add have, the caveat that it's yeah. early. UNC was the team in the national championship last year. They might have a little bit of a slog hangover. I think UNC is going to be just fine once once we get to ACC. I, I don't want to get into the, well, is UNC really a top four team in the ACC? They were the preseason number one team. We we. I know this is a UNC bashing podcast, but they're they're still gonna be, there's still two quad one opportunities against the Tar Heels this year. That that is my opinion. Yep. We'll see. Okay. okay. What are they in Ken Palm right now? I'm looking uh, at UNC twenty two. Right, right uh, two below Kansas. Yeah. So if they were to flip about four or five more spots, and all of a sudden they're not a quad one. It's just Kansas. Kim Palm, not net, but I know. Yeah. 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 UNC's going to have plenty of opportunities to build their resume. They've got a good yeah. non-conference schedule. Yeah, well, one thing, too, Ken Palm banks in on preseason expectations into their ratings. So they uh, he comes out with the ratings to, before the season starts. So some of these ratings are skewed because if you just start with a blank canvas, it might look different. But you have to start somewhere, you know. Um, how do you want to do a strength of schedule if you don't start somewhere, right? So. Well, I, I'd like to announce that, um, as stupid as it might be, I'm 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 officially bought into this basketball team. I'm buying in. I'm back on the wagon. Um, apathy has kicked in for the fan base after last year. If this team continues to take care of business, I think this fan base will be right back in PNC Arena, loud and you know, you know, nineteen thousand plus strong for the big games. Um, I, I, I'm in, I, I, this is going to be a fun, this is going to be a fun basketball season. It's been a fun football season. It's been stressful at times, but we're wrapping up the football season. We're going to have more podcasts in the near future about bowl projections. We'll have a lot more about the men's and women's basketball team. Did the women win yesterday, Matt? I, there's so much going on. Okay. Yeah. They took care of business. I know they lost to UConn. Tough game. I think it's fair to say the women's team is um, going to be really good again because when you have Wes Moore as your head ball coach, you're going to be a good you're going to be a good basketball team. They there's been a dip in talent from last year, so I, I don't know if this is the same Final Four caliber team um, as as the last couple of years, but uh, still a very very solid team to uh, and we'll be talking about them more as the as the season goes along. So this has been a long one. I, uh, any any last thoughts, Matt, before you go go off and watch your Ohio State-Michigan game? Nope. No, I'm kind of anxious to get going. So. Okay. I'm, he's, he's, I'm he's, hungry too, to be honest. He's like, wrap it up, wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> well, fans, enjoy your Thanksgiving weekend. NC State delivers a wonderful Thanksgiving gift in double overtime against UNC. And then the men's basketball team puts the icing on the cake with two wins coming out of the Bahamas. So fun show. We're going to have more in the very near future. So uh, remember to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us, Apple, Spotify, Google Play. We're also on YouTube. You can watch us on YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give this video a thumbs up and drop a comment while you're at it. Head over to thewolfpacker.com right now. Take advantage of a special deal for just 10 bucks. You get premium subscription through the beginning of next college football season. That's the end of August 2023. More than nine months to work with there. So for 10 bucks, that's a really good deal. 
head over to thewolfpacker.com now, take advantage of it. It's a great holiday gift idea. I know it's a uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday uh, weekend, so take advantage of that. Speaking of Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend, head over to rogueshop.com, rogueshop.com, that's R-O-G-U-E shop.com for your premium cannabis CBD and Delta 8 needs. They've got a deal going on right now over the weekend from Black Friday through Cyber Monday, 30% off all products. So head over there now, rogueshop.com, that's R-O-G-U-E shop.com. They've got uh, cannabis itself. They've got cartridges. They've got oils. They've got edibles. They've got lotions. They've got all kinds of great products for you to help with your stress and anxiety. If you have trouble sleeping at night, if you're dealing with chronic pain, inflammation, these are all great natural products to help with some of those things. Founded by a husband and wife outfit. The husband is a disabled veteran that was turned on to these natural products when he dealt with some of those symptoms and helped his life tremendously. So much so that he wanted to make this business to, uh, to share the wellness with everybody else. So Wolfpackers, go support RogueShop.com. They're proud supporters of the Wolfpacker podcast. Great time to do so, 30% off site-wide through uh, Cyber Monday. So you got the better part of two days to work with here once this podcast is up. Um, RogueShop.com, that's R-O-G-U-E shop.com. Last but not least, follow us on social media. Twitter handle is at the Wolfpacker is our main account. You can follow me personally at Justin H. Will. And give us a like on Facebook, NC State Wolfpack on the Wolfpacker.com. So for Matt Carter and what was a phenomenal Thanksgiving weekend for the Wolfpack, I'm Justin Williams, and this has been the Wolfpacker Podcast.